Michael Whitmore, what is the Folger Shakespeare Library? The Folger Shakespeare Library was created in 1932 by Henry Clay Folger and his wife, Emily Jordan Folger. They had a big idea, which is that the original sources for Shakespeare in his world would be of value to everyone in perpetuity. So they collected those materials and they put them here, two blocks east of the U.S. Capitol, as a gift to the nation. Why Washington, D.C.? Well, they felt it was a na an international city, it's our capital, and that this was really a truly national and international asset. So in addition to putting this marvelous collection here, they created this remarkable building, which has the first North American Tudor Theater. Uh, it has the beautiful Great Hall that we're in, which is modeled on Hampton Court, and then another beautiful, almost medieval reading room. Who are the Folgers? Mr. Folger was president of Standard Oil, and he made his fortune as uh, an oil man. He then, while he was running Standard Oil, very quietly acquired the greatest Shakespeare collection in the world, bar none, including 82 copies of the 1623 First Folio. Okay, we're going to hear that term throughout this tour, First yes. Folio. What is that? So the first folio is a collection of 36 Shakespeare plays that were published by two of Shakespeare's friends who knew him. Without that book, which was published in 1623, we probably wouldn't have 18 of Shakespeare's plays, including Macbeth and Twelfth Night and The Winter's Tale. It's probably the most studied single edition of a book in the world. And it's also a great connection to Shakespeare this writer that uh, is still used by scholars today to understand his writing. So that was put together seven years after his death. Exactly right. And how many of those exist? How many were printed? How many exist in the world today? There were probably 700 copies of the first folio printed, and there are 233 known copies of this book. One just turned up last year at uh, Saint-Omer in France. But the Folger has 82 in its collection. Uh, that's by far the largest number in any one place. And the Folgers collected the book because they knew that every copy is different. The printers corrected this book as it was being printed. And then when they put the books together, they just took from this pile and that pile. So Mr. and Mrs. Folger knew that if we wanted to get at the best version of Shakespeare's plays in this book, we'd have to compare them. Michael Whitmore here at the Folger. Are the items that you have displayed, are they open to the public? Yes, they are. Such as the first folio. Anyone can come and see a first folio at the Folger. We are free, and we are open to the public on holidays. But we were created in order to share this remarkable collection. And so that's what we do. And so do people come? How many people do you have come a year here? So we have about 80,000 people come a year. And when you come here, you can see a first folio in the corner of our great hall. You can also see one of our exhibitions. You can see a Shakespeare play performed in the first Elizabethan theater in North America. And if you are a qualified reader, if you have a reason to use our collection, you can come into our reading rooms and request items from the hundreds of thousands of items that we have in our rare collection downstairs. Is the reading room restricted to scholars? The reading room is restricted to people who have a good reason to use the collection. So often that's scholars, but if you're not a professional scholar and you need to consult something for a book you're writing, uh, we would open our materials to you. Is the Folger collection online? About 60,000 items, uh, or we would call them page openings from the collection, are online in these beautiful, high-quality digital images. So one of our missions is to open that collection to people who want to visit us virtually. We're also starting a project to make searchable about 130,000 pages of our manuscript collection. So manuscript is handwritten material. It's hard to decipher. And we're inviting others to join in a crowdsourcing initiative to look at some of those pages online. And then we will teach you how to decipher the writing. You'll decipher it, and then you're going to add to our collection. Michael Whitmore, was William Shakespeare well known? First of all, when did he live? When did he die? And was he well known? He was born uh, in the mid-16th century, and he died in 1616. That's why this year we're celebrating the 400th anniversary of his death. He was well known. 
there are hundreds of references to Shakespeare that occur during his lifetime. And one of the things we've done this year is to gather the documents that really connect us to Shakespeare the man, the talk of people about Shakespeare, whether it's in print or whether it's gossip that they've noted on a piece of vellum or paper. We wanted to get that all in one place. And so this year, our show called Life of an Icon is our attempt to bring that together so that people really can see what an impact this writer had on the people around him. Well, we are in the display hall right now for Life of an Icon. What, what's the architecture of this, this hall? And uh, then let's walk through the display. What you're looking at is a Tudor Great Hall. It's the kind of room you would put in, in a, a large family estate. It's actually something you would use for exercise. That's why it's long. Usually windows would be open to a garden and you would put your painting collection in this room. That was actually what this room was designed to look like. But after 1932, we realized that full daylight is not good for rare materials. And so we decided to limit the amount of light in this space. And so it's different from what you would see in England, but it's still grand. You've got this uh, very high ceiling. It's a city block's length. It's also got uh, Tudor strap work on the plaster above. So it's a real architectural Would gem. William Shakespeare have been comfortable in this room, or would it have been familiar? To yes, him? he would. He would have known exactly what kind of room this is. And one thing we're learning about him, he did purchase a home in Stratford called New Place, which is a, quite a fancy uh, quite a fancy pile in his hometown. And one of the things the archaeologists suspect that he did was knock down some of the bedrooms so that he could create a long gallery or a great hall. And uh, he must have liked rooms like this. It was either he who did it or it was a member of his family. But he would have recognized this kind of room. Well, let's look at some of the display items sure. you have here. What do you got? We're going to walk over first. I just mentioned New Place, which was this grand house in Stratford. Shakespeare actually needed to do something that we would call today, I think, a title search, which is to make sure that he had clear title to this property that he bought with the earnings he had uh, from his theater career. And so we're going to go over here. These are two halves of something that is called an indenture. And when this... Uh, document was executed, the two sides of the deal or the agreement looked at either side which has the identical terms on each side. One is read out aloud and the other is checked to make sure that the terms of the deal are identical. And then the indenture is cut with a wavy line so that if there's ever a dispute, you say, show me the other side of this and we'll check it. But it was a fascinating early modern anti-fraud device that was used when Shakespeare um, decided to check whether he had f clear title to this property. And here is a third piece that was, these two were kept by uh, Shakespeare and the other party in the agreement. Shakespeare would have held one of these pieces of uh, vellum in his hands. He would have kept it in his home with all of his other important Basically papers. Basically a title. Sure. to the house, yeah. in a sense. It's an important document, and this is one of the things that he saved. Did he sign it? He didn't sign this because he didn't need to. The scribes had to create this other counterfoil, which has probably in 400 years never been next to the original piece of vellum that it was a part of. This came over to us for London, and we're now bringing these pieces together for the first time. And it's a nice symbol for what this exhibition is, because never have so many documents directly connected to Shakespeare ever been in one place. And this is in centuries. And I doubt they will ever be gathered together again. So the ability to bring together a kind of congregation or fellowship of documents is this remarkable moment of connection with this writer. And that's why we really want to share it, because it's so precious to have this ability to show them.